This case, 114312, State of Kansas v. Christopher Lyman. May it please the court, Richard Ney for the appellant Christopher Lyman. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, I'd ask to reserve three minutes of my time for rebuttal. Three minutes is granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Christopher Lyman was convicted of the felony murder, aggravated battery, and child abuse of his nine-year-old nephew. Prior to trial, the district court disqualified the defendant's pathologist from testifying based on a Daubert challenge by the state. Uh, the court also refused to admit medical records of the child, although those records had been previously stipulated to by the parties. And, and finally, what we'd like to address is that the court denied a new trial in this matter based on exculpatory Brady evidence, which was held by the prosecutor at the time of trial. Let me start, if I can, with what I would see as the most egregious error by the trial court that three weeks before trial was to begin, at a Daubert hearing, the trial court disqualified an eminently qualified forensic board-certified pathologist from testifying in the case. Uh, Dr. Young had been the pathologist for Jackson County, Missouri, for Kansas City, Missouri, for 12 years. Uh, he had served in a number of cases, he testified in countless criminal cases as a forensic pathologist. He had literally the same qualifications as the state's pathologist, Dr. Mitchell. Again, prior to trial and a hearing three weeks before trial was to begin, a Daubert hearing was had. Uh, during that hearing, the state dealt with why Dr. Young should not have been allowed to testify. It centered on a number of things, but basically a theorem that the doctor had about evidence, about how to view cases. And again, without getting too far in the weeds in it, to sum it up, it was basically, look, if you have an innocent explanation, something could be natural causes, or something that could be deliberate injury, and you can't tell the difference between each are equally likely, then you can't say it's abuse. Again, he applied it to a lot of areas, but that was the sum of his opinion. Uh, the court found that to be unique, not peer reviewed, what have you. But in getting there, the state talked to the doctor at the, the hearing about, well, you testify for the defense mostly, don't you? You advertise for public defenders. And, in fact, uh, you uh, give medical evidence uh, in a case where, in the Harbor case, where the judge in the Court of Appeals, or the, at least the district judge, found you not to be credible. Okay? They spent a lot of time on that and attached the Harbor opinion, in fact, to their motion and to later pleadings. And then they went into the doctor's beliefs through his system about what he believed the correct timing was for the creation of the world. Dr. Young believes the world was created in six literal days. I know the state in the brief says seven, but God rested on the seventh, so he is saying six days. What that has to do with this opinion, I don't know, but it was featured prominently in their Daubert hearing and in their, in their brief here to you. Uh, that, that particular opinion yes. is um, typically associated with certain religious views, um, but in this hearing, was it tied somehow to his methodology? Again, I'm not going to pretend to understand everything that was on the doctor's website, okay. but okay. let's say it was. I mean, that's what the doctor was saying. Because he got disqualified. Um, he didn't get disqualified because he lacked professional credentials, right? Correct. He got disqualified because there was something about his methodology that the district court decided was not adequate under the Dahlberg standard. Is that right? 
That was the court's, well, the court gave two different opinions, one at the hearing and one in an order, but in some, yes. Okay. But let, let's be absolutely clear. Dr. Young, and if you look at his report, talked about many things to a degree of medical certainty. In Dr. Young's report, for example, just a paragraph, temporary cessations of restorations of breathing can lead to temporary lack of oxygen to the head upon restoration of oxygenation following cardiopulmonary recitation or in spontaneously following a significant long cessation, the child may develop global brain swelling and damage. And he goes on to talk about those things. This is not based on his theorem. This is based on his experience as a medical pathologist. Look at his opinions. Again, the bottom line, the doctor says, I'm not going to call this abuse because I see it could be injury or it could be these other factors. And he goes through all of the factors, how the bruising could have been caused by the lack of oxygen how the brain swelling could have been caused by that. This is a child, remember, who had many, many medical problems before this incident. So if you look at all of his opinion, not just the bottom line, why couldn't he have testified to those? Because those were based on his experience, on studies. That's the, the problem here. This was an all or nothing for the court. That's what I was going to ask. Um, right. Kind of try to focus in on that. So your argument today <clears throat> is that the district court should have sliced whatever the disqualification was more finely, and that he shouldn't certainly shouldn't have been disqualified as a testifying expert. Period, and then he shouldn't have been disqualified on many of his opinions that were tied to very well settled medical training or peer reviewed articles or whatever. He should merely have been prevented from discussing his theorem that was not viewed as sound under Daubert. Is that of course, right? yes. And is that what the defense asked for at the time? Yes. Here's what the defense attorney said during the argument on the Daubert. I'm referring to defense attorney. Quote, I believe you can allow him to testify to reasonable medical certainty, even if you want to block him from talking about the logical progression that he perceives in his process, thought process, for coming to his opinions. I don't think he has to tell. So in other words, that's exactly what the court said, slice it. I mean, if we think about this, Your Honor, there are many cases where we have the same SART testimony. And the expert says, yes, I saw trauma to this girl. I saw this, I saw that. And then based on my many experience, I think she was telling the truth and she was actually raped. Well, we don't allow that second part. We slice the opinion right there. Can the same SART expert, although has come up with whatever methodology she or he is using, to come up with her belief that the complainant is telling the truth and this was a rape? No, we don't allow that. But we certainly allow all the testimony up to that. That's yes, where I'm trying to focus. So what you just read to us was a quote from what the defense counsel sought or from what the court permitted? That was the defense counsel okay. arguing to the judge okay. at the Daubert hearing. All right. I'm, I don't have the volume That's right okay. here. That's, I, we can find it. I just wanted to make right. sure. Uh, that's what I had asked for. I wanted to make sure we were communicating. So okay. the, in, the inferential test just layered on top of what you believe is the standard opinion based on experience and medical training. And it can be sliced. Yes. I mean, because that goes to, is this abuse or there isn't abuse? But this is the causation testimony, right? That's right. the key The key factor is causation. Well, it is, or is that right. right? But the, Dr. Young was testifying, look, you saw these bruises. Let me tell you how those, from a medical aspect, those bruises could have caught, been caused. He testifies, and I can quote the testimony, but we'd be here a while. But he, in sum, testifies in the hearing... Look, there's lots of ways if you're being denied oxygen and you're not having the flow of blood, even the slightest touch will make a child bruise. The district court, I'm trying to understand what the district court did, and it appears to me the district court sliced the causation testimony out because the district court did not find the experts 
method to be reliable or to satisfy the Daubert test. Is that correct? Is that I, I think the court got hung up. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to speak for what the court well, was thinking. Well, I'll, I'll just read the, yeah. the, the, the order says, Dr. Young, rather than using a methodology known in the field, has approached the causation issue using, as the chief mentioned, the inferential test. Right. And that's the problem that the district court had. I, I agree, but I think we're talking causation and causation. How could the bruises have been caused? How could the brain swelling have been caused? He gave complete medical information about that. He gave literature about that from the medical journals. So that was separate from, and therefore, from his opinion, it wasn't child abuse because no one saw it. That was basically his Is, Are you line. saying the district court got the facts wrong? That, that when the district court says Dr. Young approaches the causation issue using the inferential test, that's wrong as a matter of fact. Yes, because, again, there's... I think the difference is, Your Honor, if we're talking about a homicide and it's a bullet wound, we can say it's a bullet wound and the cause is homicide because I just think he looks like he was murdered. We, there's no, what we're talking about is the doctor should have been allowed to say there was a bullet wound. That's a medical determination. It's based on his experience. It's not made, based on this inferential test because the inferential test really went to the issue of was this child abuse or not. Not how the injuries or brain swelling or bruises could have been occurred. How, how does that help the defendant's case if his testimony is so limited? So if, if in fact, he ended up testifying there was bruising and it, it can result as a matter of lack of oxygen, or, if that's what he was limited to and any lay juror could observe in photographs that there was bruising. No. He was saying, the pathologist, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Frazier, mm -hmm. was saying there's bruisers to this child. They could only have occurred from mm -hmm. child abuse, someone grabbing him, hitting him, whatever. Dr. Uh, Young testified, and this is from the Daubert hearing, mm -hmm. in a situation for all living people, we have a blood coagulation system with forces that allow broken blood vessels to clot off and not bleed anymore, and also a system to dissolve blood clots. It is a very intricate system. If there is a situation in which the system is impaired, and there are many ways you can impair the system. One of them is to have a lack of oxygen through a lack of breathing, which the child did. That is one way to impair that system. Another thing is to have a generalized situation where you've got global brain damage and the release of all kinds of factors that dissolve clots. That's another way to damage. In either situation, these are natural causes now. I've only mentioned two possible ways. Even small handling of the child in a very, very minor fashion can lead to bruises. In, which essence, are essential, he was, well, in essence, he was saying the child had a, a, health, a system, his health was impaired in a way that made bruising more likely from slight touch. Right. Okay. That was critical. Also, the brain swelling. I read some of his report about the brain swelling, that that could have been caused by natural process. So if you look at his testimony at the Daubert hearing, but more importantly, if you look at his op written opinion, it is based on medical findings. And he gives a whole list of them in his opinion, which is, of course, in the record, um, on, page three, on page three, or two and three. He's talking about what did the pathologist here find and how could that have been caused other than by abuse? And we know there is case after case where various types of conditions of children are seen as abuse where it may not be so. And Dr. Young was shedding light on the other possibilities. That would have been key here. That was the defense case. Are, are you conceding that the inferential test that was excluded was proper? Was I mean, improper? Was proper under Daubert. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, what you're wanting here to do is, is split and, and keep out or it's what the district court did was wrong because it didn't segregate the inferential test from other re relevant testimony that it had expertise to testify to. Right. Are you saying then that the inferential test, that the trial court was correct in excluding that under Daubert? 
No, not this. I, the inferential test really, I mean, much is made of it, and Dr. Young makes much of it, I guess, on his website, but it's a pretty simple theorem, and here's what he's asked by the prosecutor at the Daubert, and he agrees to. The prosecutor says, talking about the inferential test, one cannot surmi reliably surmise past events from physical evidence unless there's only one plausible explanation for that event. Is that the inferential test? He says, yeah. What that translates to here is, and again, I, I don't know that it was something that should have been subject for testimony or not, but look, I see a child. His condition, these bruises, could be caused by natural causes because of lack of circulation, or they could be abuse. And with those two possibilities, with either of them being possible, I can't say it's abuse. That's what he's saying. When there's not an eyewitness. When there's not an eyewitness. Now, that's not saying the jury couldn't take other evidence, past con situations, other observations, and weigh it. He, he, in essence, he kind of takes the forensic out of forensic pathology, doesn't well, he? I mean, that's what it amounts to, because he talks about what you can do in the present. Versus, I mean, it's a thought, sort of a... I, I'm very much with you, Your Honor, because yeah. I was here on a case where Dr. Mitchell testified, I found this to be homicide because I didn't believe the defendant's story. Mm -hmm. That kind of takes the medical science out of pathology, too. Mm -hmm. But that was allowed. I'm not saying we even need to get there, Your Honor. I'm saying that's something, that just like the same SART, you don't have to let an expert go that far, but that doesn't mean you can exclude everything they've said, which is based on medicine. Were the uh, um, uh, state's medical witnesses confronted with these uh, causation theories on cross-examination, and did they concede that those were possibilities? They were confronted to agree as best as defense counsel could put them. They pretty much denied it was possible. I think Dr. Mitchell said no, couldn't be natural causes. Dr. Frazier said couldn't be natural causes. And let's remember, Your Honor, the jury was not married to these experts or to experts in general because the whole aggravated sodomy charge, which they tried to shop here to the jury, the jury rejected. When they heard evidence from Dr. Stetler on the DNA issues, so this was a close case. And this, losing this expert at the eve of trial, was just a disaster. And we add to that, on top of that, the court denying the admission of the medical evidence of the child, which had been stipulated to, at least on foundation, um, because there was no expert to testify about it. I'm not sure how medical records of a child who had been hospitalized numerous times is irrelevant in a case like this. Can you um, tell me what exactly was the stipulation? Was it foundation and what else? That, that was basically it. So it wasn't admissibility, it was foundation. Right. Okay. I mean, they are distinct concepts. Well, medical uh, experts, or, sure. excuse me, medical records are subject to stipulation all the time about foundation, so you don't have to drag in a bunch of record keepers, that sort I, of stuff. I understand that, Your Honor. Yeah. But what couldn't be relevant here? I mean, if we have foundation, then the only question is relevancy. The whole, this child's medical history, his nine months of life's medical history, is relevant. People testified to it. He'd been in the hospital with his mother, testified, uh, various other individuals. So the basis for exclusion was just that there was not a medical expert to testify about the records. As I understand it, the state objected and the court sustained it and said, well, we don't have an expert. We necessarily looked at these or we brought them in. But they've been stipulated to. And, and certainly, you don't need an expert to bring in records. But How? the stipulation was worded to tie it to direct examination or cross-examination for right. use. So um, that does appear to have been the basis for the stipulation. Well, and I think that the state, the defense certainly was expecting Dr. Young to testify at the time of that stipulation. So that there would have been Dr. Young commenting on those records, which he had viewed. When was Why? the stipulation? I'm sorry, I, I don't know, but it was before the Daubert hearing, I know. Would those records not have been available for use to cross-examine Dr. Mitchell? who was the pathologist for the state, to say, doctor, are you aware of this 
infant's medical history? And he said, no, we hadn't seen those. They had not looked at these records. Dr. Frazier or Dr. Mitchell had not reviewed these records. I mean, which is very convenient. I mean, and not for the defense, but it's convenient for the argument. Well, then they're not admissible. How do I use something for cross-examination? Well, I looked at it and no, I wouldn't change my mind. This was abuse, which was pretty much the bottom line of Dr. Frazier's image. The records could have been used with some of the lay witnesses, couldn't they? I mean, some of the, um, his mother, the, the other caretakers that were aware of his previous well, medical they, issues? Yeah, they testified to these hospitalizations. So, but the question of how does a lay witness get these in if they're not admissible by their relevancy? And in fact, I think the, the court cut off the defense in a, in a number of areas where they, where they wanted the mother to testify, well, what did the doctor say about this diagnosis? Didn't he have this? They said, oh, hold on, stop, okay. which the records would have expanded. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Please support uh, Jason Oxford representing the Gary County Attorney's Office. I'm ready to proceed. Um, it seems like the uh, court's focus today is on the exclusion of the expert testimony, and uh, I would first start with um, the idea that the trial court did not commit error by excluding the testimony. I don't think that you can um, splice or separate. Um, the testimony that this expert would have been given, obviously the primary uh, testimony that was going to be sought by the defense by using this expert was for causation. That's where the court had a problem with the inferential test, with the methodology, not the results. It's the methodology. And the court goes through the Daubert factors one by one and finds that um, it doesn't, the, the expert's testimony, the expert's methodology, most importantly, uh, does not pass muster on any of the Daubert reliability factors. Is, is, the, is this inferential test, is that even, I don't even know how to ask this question. It strikes me as a logical um, postulate rather that, than a scientific claim subject to the scientific method. And I think that's what the court found. But then if that's the case, why would Daubert even apply to exclude it? Well, Judge, I think that it, it's, you still have to look at the, the factors, the reliability of the methodology, because that's what he is, he's proposing, this expert testimony, this expert witness is proposing that it, this is um, scientific te uh, testimony, scientific knowledge. Uh, and, and so, and that's what I think that the... Well, your opposing counsel suggests that all the underlying testimony that actually was relying on scientific methodology was sound, and that the district court potentially confused that with this logical inference, I, I a logical think... postulate that just says, if there's two possibilities, then you can't, you can't make a causation determination. Uh, and I think that what the, the court says is is that, you know, and I know the court uses the term junk science, I don't want to really focus on that. What I see the court doing is the court seeing that the, um, the focus of the testimony is going to be mainly the causation portion of this, and it's going to be what um, this testimony, this expert is going to be testifying to. And the court doesn't see that as reliable, so the court says, I, I, I'm going to use the Daubert factors to make the determination uh, that this is not reliable, and that's what the court does. Counsel, was the doctor's um, opinion <clears throat> that uh, bruising in a child can be an artifact of the child's underlying vulnerability, uh, physical vulnerability, this oxygen, inadequate oxygen in them? In, a, in an a, inadequate circulation. Is that opinion dependent on the inferential test or methodology? I, I don't know that that opinion is dependent on the inferential test, but again... Uh, and isn't it true that um, 
parties and courts splice and dice expert opinions fairly regularly. And, and this that's, is, this I'm sorry. Not, this is not something that's unheard of in the law. It's not unheard of, but again, I think that the, the trial court sees this testimony being introduced mainly on the issue of causation, mainly using this this expert's And what posture. the opinion I just gave you, the medical opinion that bruising can result from this underlying vulnerability, is that's a medical opinion. Sure. It can be held to a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Yes. Uh, um, it's just putting another causation, possible causation out there. Right. It's not opining that it is, in fact, the cause, right? Right, right. And and through cross examination of all the state's experts, okay. um, the the I think that the defense, the trial court sees this again as the defense trying to insert testimony that is does not pass muster with Daubert's scientific reliability factors, and says I'm not going to let you put on that kind of evidence. That's the the majority of, uh, I believe that's what the trial court probably believed the majority of the evidence was going to be was causation as it related to the postulate. The court probably, it, it, the court sees this as a situation where through cross-examination of other witnesses. Did that happen? Witnesses, there was a question earlier about what happened with the state's experts in terms of cross-examination on their opinions. Were they asked about this alternative Yes. Potential. Um, there, if I could, just a second. If you just tell me yes, I believe you. I, but I, I'm I, just asking. I'm going to tell. You, I believe that that's the case because I recall reading uh, some stuff through the the, uh, the appellee's brief. I did not write the appellee's brief. Mr. Hostetler before me wrote that, but I, I've reviewed it uh, and and I'm all but certain that um, there was questions related to all kinds of other possibilities. So, in uh, other words, the type of testimony that um, you're opposing counsel is saying today should have been permitted from the defense expert, in fact, came in through cross-examination of the state experts. I would agree with that, yes. Okay, that's what I was trying to get to. Thank you. Yes. It, it appears to me that part of the judge's ruling, as he talks about it at page three, is that the uh, defense's proposed expert can't tie these possibilities to the facts of the case. Um, in other words, that the nature of the bruising in this case um, was had had to have come through that 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 pattern of bruising evidenced something other than just a fall or a um, and so that 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 tying that a natural cause that the person the doctor had to give a opinion. And that there was no that opinion was based upon this theory, um, and so can you explain to me part of part of what I'm not sure from the record is what that pattern of bruising was, but also um, can you explain to me if if it was possible to separate those concepts of applying it to the case? Uh, well, according to the other experts that testified, it was not possible. Uh, I think all the experts testified to the injuries, the bruising um, that was found all over the child. Um, these were not the types of uh, bruises, injuries, afflictions, uh, whatever you want to call it, that would have been caused uh, by negligence or you know, the, the accidental falls, that kind of stuff, that it had to have been um, caused by um, a, a an aggressor, I guess. Uh, the, the problem here is, was the court weighing evidence or was the court saying that the experts, there was a, a, a legal reason for the expert's testimony not to be admitted? Yeah, I think that's exactly what the court's saying is that, that there is a legal reason. And, and if, if the court reviews the record, you'll see that, that this doctor believes through his, his postulate, his theory, his methodology, believes that if there is no witness to um, a, a, an event, then nobody can say for certain that the event occurred, despite forensic science that we have, despite uh, what we know about forensics and what we know about um, science and in, in the investigation, the context of the investigation of, um, uh, of deaths, of, of, of criminal acts, that kind of stuff, um, that there's no possible way that you could you could make a complete and absolute determination um, that 
a certain event was caused by a particular person or whatever, unless there was a witness there. Well, the weather was a particular person is outside the realm of the medical experts, isn't it? Because that really does get to more to the question your opposing counsel was talking about, where we limit sane evidence, for example, sane sexual assault, assault nurse examiner testimony. We don't let them to say the defendant did it. Right. We, we don't even let them say this was a rape if the evidence is just non right non -addictive. and he's not he wouldn't be saying that the defendant didn't do it okay. he would be saying it didn't happen so you just mis misspoke so yes i'm sorry right. and so this pattern of bruising apparently there was some explanation that it, there was bruising on the head that appeared to have been caused by someone moving their hand and and compressing the head is that accurate i believe so judge um, and so that was part of the reason that some of the experts eliminated any other natural cause. Is that, that accurate? That's, that's accurate. And so was this expert um, cross-examined at the Daubert hearing about that? Was, did, was that inquiry made there? Um, I know that he was cross-examined uh, extensively. I don't know if specifically on that point. On, on those points, but I would, I would have to guess that that's what happened uh, from what I'm reading in the brief uh, and other portions of the record, that that, that would have been a, a major issue of contention. Why can't, why can't an expert come in and just say, based on my evaluation of the evidence and my training and experience, I don't believe that anyone can state within a reasonable degree of medical certainty what caused these injuries? I think that, again, that the trial court looks at the methodology used by that particular expert to come to that conclusion. It's not about the conclusion. But what if the methodology is just where there are two equally plausible explanations? Then it's, it's, outside, uh, it's outside the degree of medical certainty that's required to come to a conclusion as to causation. I think if there was another expert that used a methodology that passed the muster of the Dauber examination, of the Dauber factors. Why is it, that, why, I, this is where I'm hung up. Why is this even a methodology at all? I, well, because that's, this is what the, the defense is, is putting forth. This is what the expert's testimony is saying it is. is that this is a, a scientific test that he has, that he's laid out, this un peer reviewed uh, theory that he's he's come up with. I, I'm what I, I guess my attempt to answer the question that you posed is that if if there was another expert who it's just it's just it, we're, 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 it seems to me we're making something relatively simple way more complicated than it needs to be. This is just one expert disagreeing <coughs> with another. One expert says I have a causation opinion within a reasonable degree of medical certainty, and another expert says. I looked at the same evidence, and I cannot arrive at a causation opinion within a reasonable degree of medical certainty. And again, I, I know we're, we're disagreeing on this. I, I think it's the methodology. I think it's looking at. Let me ask you another question about that. The district court judge said clearly the theory is based on biblical themes and Mosaic law. Is that an appropriate rationale for the district court to use? In, in, just to see, I'm not, I, I don't want to um, get into the mind of what the court was, was saying. I don't want to try to, I, I don't want, I'm, I'm not here to deem Well, let's just, say, yeah, let's just, and let me just ask you whether that's factually correct. I mean, it, it, this is a, a statement of fact in the district court's order. Yeah, and, and I think what the, the If court, the district court got that fact wrong, do we have a problem? Could you, could you rephrase? I'm trying to figure what... Well, what, the right. district court stated a fact. Clearly, the theory is based on biblical themes and mosaic law. And, and I, I guess I'm struggling to see whether that's factually accurate. I, and if, it's, if that's a mistake of fact, that's one of the prongs that we may look at for an abuse of discretion. I, I don't think it's a mistake of fact. I think what the court is trying to do is try to get to the bottom of how this, and maybe the court misspoke, but I think that, that the court is trying to get to the bottom of the methodology of how he comes up with the, this idea, not that it's necessarily absolutely based on biblical themes or views or, or, or what, whatever. Um, I think his comments are more to 
um, to establish how the you know if you do not have a witness that witness that, that perceives an event that when it occurs I think that's what the the, the court is trying to do through that it's, statement is what got Dr. Young in trouble the fact that he's placed the label of inferential test on what Justice Stegall was describing as what experts would do one expert says within a reasonable degree of medical certainty it is my view that this is this and another expert says I don't see how you can say that could, could you just uh, repeat the beginning of what you're your question was, I'm sorry, Justice. To summarize, is what got Dr. Young in trouble the fact that he has labeled inferential test for what some experts might do otherwise? I, I shouldn't I, say otherwise, but as, as uh, Justice Stiegel was saying, don't some experts come in and say, I don't care what the state's expert said, you can't be that certain or you cannot... Uh, uh, have that opinion I, I be think because and then explain I, I wouldn't think, that be appropriate I, I think that what gets um, uh, Dr. Young in, in trouble <clears throat> is that um, there if you look at what he's proposing first off there's nobody else in in this field of forensic science that believes what he believes um, that you just you absolutely cannot come to a conclusion uh, using uh, forensic standards uh, of the of the day of of the community the, the friends community, um, he doesn't follow that. He, he he nobody in his field believes his theory essentially. Nobody who's a forensic pathologist believes that forensics are ridiculous. I'm sorry. No, no. In essence, nobody who's a forensic pathologist believes that sure. forensic pathology is impossible. Right. What do, what opinions can be given then, according to Dr. Young, unless you have an eyewitness? Um, well, if, if there is no eyewitness to an event, then you cannot say for certain that the event occurred. That, that's my understanding of his, his theory. And how close can you come to that if you don't have an eyewitness? Uh, well, is, is, the, is the expert relegated to just getting on the stand and say, I don't know? Well, I think the other experts believe that you can have, have a great amount of certainty of what occurred or what caused a particular event, what caused, the, in this case, the injuries to the child um, using forensic standards. You're out of time. Do you have any further presentation for us? We've taken up a lot of your time with our questions. No, I, I, I have a lot of things that are written down, but um, uh, it, it appears that the key to the uh, oral arguments today were questions related to the um, expert, and so I, I don't have anything further. The court doesn't have any other questions for me. What are you asking us to do? Um, I'm asking the court to um, uh, affirm all the rulings of the district court and to deny the defendant a uh, new trial. All right. Thank you, counsel. May it please the court. Mr. Me... Hayes, this is where I'm struggling. Okay. You have an expert who definitely has the education to be able to say, here are all the medical reasons that can cause a subdural, subdural hematoma, bruising, blah, blah, blah. But to make that relevant to this case, doesn't that expert have to be able to bridge the theory, the, all of those possibilities, to the injuries in this case? And isn't the way the doctor bridges that to a degree of medical certainty is by applying his theory that because nobody witnessed this event, we can't eliminate those causes. No, he doesn't. Where he comes up with his inferential theory, whatever you want to call it, is just as Justice Stiegel said, it's that just at the bottom line, I won't call this child abuse if, in fact, there's nothing that could not be explained by natural causes. But then how does he say this illness um, history uh, breathing difficulties 
to a degree of medical certainty is what caused this child's bruising. Well, he does. And let me read one sentence from his report. It's, it's, it, he says, in other words, after talking about all the issues, the findings in this child in their entirety can be explained by the child's natural disease. They are not necessarily the result of child abuse. Now, how is that opinion by a medical board-certified forensic pathologist not admissible? Well, but did on cross-examination he reach that opinion based upon the fact that he couldn't, he couldn't say it was child abuse? No. He's talking about the diseases, his experience with diseases. It's the other leap, as, as Justice Byer said, like when we have a sane start saying, yes, there's injuries, they're consistent, they're, and then she was raped. That's what we don't let experts do. And, and we would not have had a problem with the court saying, well, you can't say, although the, the state's experts were allowed to say it was absolutely abuse and couldn't be anything else. We wouldn't have any problem with you limiting the doctor from saying, you can't say it's abuse unless there was a witness. I agree, that may be out an out position that we wouldn't necessarily allow, though it's logical. It's just a misstatement of law. <clears throat> right. I mean, right? That's just a legal conclusion that's just wrong. But, but the defense is being deprived of this opinion that everything that was seen there, based on his medical experience, could have been explained by natural disease. That has nothing to do with the inferential test. That has to do with medicine. And is he talking about the actual injuries in yes. this case? Yes. As opposed to the theoretical no. the, textbook he, issues? Right. The sentence is, uh, in other words, the findings in this child, in their entirety, he looked at the medical, he looked at the, what Dr. Mitchell had decided. So that's what the defense was deprived of here. I mean, and that was hugely significant. One, one last point. The question about cross-examination, yeah, did Ms. Eppelman kind of throw some things at their experts? But their experts, Dr. Frazier and Dr. Mitchell, just stonewalled it. They said, no, not a possibility, not a possibility, not a possibility. I can do that cross-examination of witnesses all day long unless I have an expert to say, yes, it is a possibility. I'm just kind of some idiot throwing questions at a witness who's the expert and telling me I'm absolutely wrong. It doesn't help. Counsel, what are you asking us to do? Your Honor, we are asking for all the reasons um, in the brief uh, and what we've argued today to reverse Mr. Lyman's conviction for this death and allow a trial where expert forensic pathology evidence is allowed. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel. We thank both counsel for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.